I'd like to invite you to give here now to the reading of God's Word. We're in Luke chapter 6 and reading verses 27 to 36. So if you would, listen now. This is the Word of God. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. And I'd love it if we could pray together before we dig in, if you'd please join me. God, we do thank you for your word. Even when your word is challenging, we thank you. For we know, Lord, that all of your intentions for us are good, and that your word is true, and that your way is life. And so lead us and guide us as we yield to you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, we're starting a new series today from the Gospel of Luke, and uh, the series is called Worth It. And I will tell you, there's a, there's a, a scripture, it's actually two verses uh, from Luke chapter 9 that we'll actually kind of come back to again and again because it's, it's really at the center of this whole series. And uh, the, these are the words of Jesus in 9, 23, and 24. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And, and just, just a, a couple of quick comments about this before we get into kind of the specifics of today's passage. But I, I would say, first of all, the most important thing that we can say about Luke chapter 9 here, these words of Jesus, is that he actually meant them, right? He actually meant what he said. That is, he will not, he will not force anybody into relationship with him. We, we always have a choice. He pursues us. He pursues us by the Holy Spirit, but there is no point where he says that we have to take him as our Savior, right? We have a choice in the matter. Every knee will one day bow to Jesus, but it, it doesn't mean that he's going to make us be his followers. But if we do want to be his followers, he wants us to be very clear. He actually calls us to count the cost, to understand the commitment that if, in fact, we want to be his followers, he says, we will have to deny ourselves, essentially die to ourselves that we might live fully for Jesus Christ, that we would give up our own way, our own desires, and give our lives over to the desires of Jesus Christ, that we would truly live for him. And and I think it's important to just acknowledge that this, this is actually nonsense to the world. The world thinks this is crazy. Right? In a world, and, and I think particularly in our culture we see right now, an intensity of this demand for self-determination. I insist, I demand that I have my own way. Certainly we see that in our culture, but the truth is that this goes all the way back to the fall of mankind, that we have always had within us a drive, a desire for our own way rather than for God's. That is our, our deep brokenness before him. And in this is nonsense to a world if we could just kind of boil it all down. What is it that the world's really after? I think that we could say that essentially what the world is after is to minimize pain, right? Minimize pain and maximize pleasure. In a world that thinks like that, this is nonsense. It is, it is crazy. But here's the other thing, and this is, this is most important about all of this, I think. The other thing about the teaching of Jesus here is he tells us, and this is true, that actually this is the only way to have what is truly life. That in fact, on the day, at the moment, 
that we determine that we will no longer live for ourselves, that is actually the moment that we begin to truly live. When we say, this life is no longer going to be about me, it's going to be about him. It's going to be about serving, loving, following Jesus Christ. And, and not only that, and this is where the name of this series comes in. It's the name of the series, Worth It. That is to say that whatever we are asked to deny ourselves, whatever it is that we are asked to take on, whatever it is that we're asked to sacrifice, it is worth it. When we count up the cost, when we do that calculation, Jesus is always worth it. To know him, to love him, to have him in our lives, it is always worth it. And what we find is that the degree to which we are turning our lives over to him, the degree to which we are devoted to him, and completely so, is the degree to which we know what is truly life, his power, his presence, his love in our lives. And, and, and it's just true, right? The way I think of this is, it's kind of like spiritual physics, right? That you cannot, at the same time, be filled with yourself, with ourselves, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? That just that doesn't work. You read in the scriptures about people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. I can guarantee you one thing that they are not filled with, and that is themselves. And so what we're seeking in this series is to empty ourselves, to truly take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow Jesus to give up our lives for him so that we can know what is truly life. Amen? Amen. Amen. I can tell you're excited. So let's bring on the denial, Pastor. Let's do it. <laughs> Sign me up. So um, our, <laughs> our scripture today, as we're looking at it, kind of focusing in then specifically, we find, honestly, one of the most difficult commands, I think, and I think probably you'll agree, one of the most difficult commands that Jesus ever gave us, and that is love your enemies, right? If you were given a piece of paper, and this is true for me too, if we were given a piece of paper and it had love your and then a blank space, fill in the blank, there are a lot of things that we're going to put in that blank before we're going to put enemies. Love your children, love your family, love your wife, love your church family, love your neighbor, uh, love your dog, right? There's, there's a lot of stuff that's going in that blank before we write enemy down. What an extraordinary thing to ask us. I mean, really. Because actually, on one side, it is, a, it is an astonishing sacrifice to ask us to make. Because it is to sacrifice, to give up, to deny ourselves the anger that we feel toward people who don't care, who are maybe even against us, to sacrifice our anger, to sacrifice our pride, to sacrifice our control, to sacrifice that sense of of a right to retaliation. This is a huge sacrifice that the Lord is asking us. And not only that, on the other side, maybe even more that he's asking on the plus side, on the things he's asking us to actually do, to positively do, not just to give up, but to do, to do good to those who would harm us, praying for them, blessing them, doing good, lending, giving, loving. This is, this is certainly the hardest thing that he's ever asked us to do, and this This really brings us to our first point, and that is that the only way that this can even begin to make sense to me is if it comes from Christ's own love. It comes from Christ's own love. Jesus says, then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Jesus says, if you'll actually do what I'm teaching you to do, you'll be acting as a, as a child of your heavenly Father. You will, in other words, just to use another way that we would talk about this, you are showing a family resemblance, right? A family resemblance. So I, I'm, uh, I'm experiencing this thing right now. It's, it's very curious, right? This is, I, I'm experiencing this, this dynamic where uh, I'm actually seeing more of my parents in me and, um, and it's, I mean, it's interesting stuff. I mean, you're going to think I'm really weird with this, but, um, but like I noticed that I, I, I'm walking like my dad walks. And like I remember my granddad walking, like I'm just trotting along. And I'm like, wait a minute, I recognize this. <laughs> I, even, I even cough sometimes and I think, man, that sounded just like my dad and my granddad when they cough. And so stuff like that. But then you know, more important stuff that I'm really grateful for, like, like the courage of convictions and patriotism and, and most importantly of all, 
you know, so grateful to have passed down to me uh, the, this love for Jesus, right? So grateful for that. And, and, I, and so I'm seeing more of my parents in me, and, and, and I'm seeing more of myself and my kids at the same time. That's how weird this dynamic is. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but, but then if we ramp this up, right, like ramp this up all the way to our Heavenly Father, we see something that's actually not just important, it's actually essential to who we were made to be. And that is that we were actually made in His image. We were made to bear a family resemblance, made to bear the glory of God, to display His goodness, His character, right? And we're actually being remade. We, we know we're being remade as those in Christ. We're being remade by Him, in Him, by His power, to become more and more like him. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So what does that look like? What is that glorious image? Well, God reveals himself. Certainly, we know in the Old Testament God speaks through the prophets, revealing who God is, revealing his heart, right? And then, and then Jesus comes. And then Jesus comes. And this is what we read in the beginning of the book of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And so God comes in the flesh, and Jesus, the Son of God, made flesh, and he radiates the glory of God. He displays the glory of God. He is the glory of God. And, and when we see God's glory, what do we see? We see a love that is so radical that we couldn't even imagine it. I mean, who could make up a love like this? To think that even though we, mankind, rejected God, rebelled against him, even still, his love holds fast. You know, when we turn from God, I, I think he would have been perfectly justified to speak a word of destruction. And you think about this, God spoke the universe into being, spoke us into being. God could do the opposite. God could just say the word and the universe just disintegrates, right? But God doesn't do that. He doesn't speak that word. He speaks a word of love and of grace and of mercy. He has spoken most especially, most clearly, most powerfully on the cross of Jesus Christ. He took our punishment on himself so that we could be made whole. Nobody can make up a love like this. Romans 5.10 says that our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. That's what the scripture says, while we were still his enemies enemies. When we're thinking about loving our enemies, the only way that I even understand how to begin is to look at the cross of Jesus and see that when we were his enemies, even then, even then, he died for us. Not because we were righteous, not because we were loyal, not because we deserved it, not because somehow we had earned it, not because we were yearning for him. No, no, he did it as a simple choice of love. He did it because of his love for us. And I'll tell you, in as much as we allow him, allow him to remake us in his love, as much as we're willing to do that, we are actually being remade into the people that we were meant to be. People after God's own heart, a people who reflect his glory. And I'll tell you, it is a choice though. And this brings us to our second point, and that is this conscious decision, what I think that we could call our agape choice. Our agape choice. So thinking about, okay, well, who am I, what makes me who I am, and, and so forth. Like, what, what's going to determine how I live? And, and, and I think that we all know that, okay, genetics has a lot to do with it. Not, not quite as much as people thought at one time. I mean, just a few years ago, people thought there was a gene for, like, absolutely everything. And I think we got that that maybe was a little overblown. But still, still, genetics has a really big part in who we are. Not only that, like how we're trained up. Right? Because we can be trained into thought patterns and behavior patterns and so on. And you take into account also the brokenness of the world. We're just right in the middle of it. And our own brokenness, our own original sin, and how that can just keep a hold of us. But here's the truth. If we are, in fact, in Christ Jesus, 
And we are adopted into a whole new family, a whole new family line, a whole new family resemblance. We are born again into the Spirit, the Spirit dwelling in us, remaking us, reshaping us after the image of Jesus Christ. I tell you what, a decision to follow Jesus Christ, it truly is a decision to be remade. It is a decision to be reshaped so that, so that our hearts love like His, our minds think like His, and we live and act out a mercy like His. And what we know is, of course, this is not natural. There is nothing natural to us about this love. You know, the, the New Testament is written uh, primarily, almost entirely, in, uh, in ancient Greek, right? So in, in ancient Greek, there's actually more than one word for love. Uh, we, in English, we just kind of use that one blanket, you know, love, one word for like every type of love, but they actually had different words for the different types of love. So for instance, there was one uh, called storge that's like, a, it's like natural, instinctual love, like you would have for your children, right? You, you see your child for the first time or maybe even just kicking around in the womb and you just, you just have this affection, this natural love for that child. Uh, th- there is um, eros, which I'm not going to go too far into, uh, romantic love, right? Um, there, there is philia, which is a, a friendship love, a, uh, you know, a, a kinship love. And the thing about all of these other types of love is that they are natural. They're, they're more or less natural to us. So for instance, you think about how you become friends with somebody. You, you're around them, you meet them, you spend some time with them, you, you realize you have things in common, you enjoy each other's company. There is no point where you have to make a decision of will, I am going to direct myself to become friends with this person, right? That's not how it works. It is much more natural than that. But you see, Jesus here is not calling us to any of those kinds of love. He is calling us to an unnatural love. He is calling us to a love of decision. That is to agape. What what we talk about is unconditional love. That is to say that this love is not based on the person's beauty. It's not based on how lovable they are. It's not based on how nice they are to us. It's not based on our similarity to them. It is based on a choice. And that choice is this. I choose to love this person, to direct my will toward their good because... Christ first loved me. I am going to love this person as Jesus loves me. It is a choice. You know, um, the, the thing I think that keeps us from actually applying much of this to our lives, and I'm, I'm including myself in this too, is that we, we look at this and we just think, okay, that's impossible. There's, there's no way I can do this. There's no way. Like, okay, let's take, for example, this part. If someone demands your coat, offer them your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. Anyone. (laughs) And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. And and what we do is we tend to make this, we're tempted to make it into this sort of strict legalism. Right? Like this is the exhaustive list. Do these things. Do them exactly. And then you're good. Right? We make it into this strict legalism. and, And you think about it. All of a sudden, it, the impossibility of it just kind of rises to the surface. So, for instance, what if, think about this, what if people found out, the word is out, all you have to do is go up to a Christian, find you a Christian, go up to them and say, I'm going to need that shirt, I'm going to need your money, I'm going to need your car, give me your house, by the way, what's your ATM number, right? What's your PIN? And all of a sudden, stuff gets really messed up. Like messed up for us, for sure, right? But messed up for the world because who has all the, Christian, all the money? Uh, not the Christians, right? And so who's going to help the people that are in need? Well, not us. <laughs> and then Christians are going to start hiding, right? This is what I'm picturing. Like you're hiding in your house and you're just peeking around through the curtains, make sure nobody's out there before you go out. And then you're walking down the street with your fingers in your ears. La, 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 la. I'm not listening. Right? Like, that's us. That's what we'd have to do. So we think through things like that. And we're like, man, I don't know. This just seems impossible. How about if we just try to forget Jesus said it? How about that? Right? But I tell you what. Um, Jesus wasn't here introducing a strict legalism. Like we, we make this list and then we're good. 
What Jesus is doing, I believe, is what he's always doing, and that is driving after our hearts. The ordering of our loves, the transformation of our hearts, so that his law is written on our hearts, it's not conscripted on us, so that we actually become the kind of people who want to help people, who want to give, who want to forgive, who want to see people come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? We are those who have hearts that look like Jesus. And, and so he gives us a list, says, hey, here's a picture of what this looks like when you live out my love. It looks like someone who's giving. It looks like someone who cares about people, right? And, and for sure, when, when we start to really think about this decision, I think one of the most important things that we can say is that when and if I make this decision that I'm going to love with unconditional love, it will not be because I'm awesome. That will not be why. It will not be because I'm a really good person. If I, in fact, make this decision to love someone unconditional, to love an enemy, it will be because the Lord Jesus Christ has inspired that love, He is transforming me in that love, and He has empowered me by that love. It will be by His own hand. You know, I I spent some time praying about these two words in this passage because it was like I, I I couldn't let it let it go. Like I had to know, God, what do you mean when you say here credit and reward? What is it that you're talking about? Right? He says here, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love you, uh, who love them. And, And then he goes through all this doing good, lending, and so forth. And then he says at the end, then your reward, your reward from heaven will be very great. So my God, what is it? And And I feel like God directed me to these two words, and I think the key is there. From heaven. The reward is from heaven. That is to say, and I'm sure you got there way ahead of me, the reward is Jesus. I mean, it is is Him. He is the reward. To know Him, to know His power, to know His love in our lives. Because here's the thing. If we are always only loving in these natural loves, we don't need supernatural power for that. It's natural. Anybody can do it. Sinners can do it. People far from God can do it. And they do. If we are only ever loving in these natural ways, we will never, never be dependent upon the supernatural touch of God. But when we yield to Christ and we determine, Lord, I I am one who is listening. And I, I intend, I choose to love this person even though they don't care about me, even though they're against me. I choose it. What we find is that the Lord empowers that love. His word has power. His promises are backed up by his mighty power, by his great love poured out in our lives. And that, really, that brings us to our last point, and, um, and that is uh, the witness of a peculiar situation. So it's hard to believe, hard for me to believe, that, uh, do you know, it's actually been over 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Do you know that? 1989, right? over 30 years now, and, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, and, and I think if you were around then, um, you remember this, communist East Germany, Germany was um, really, really bad. Like, I think, good rule of thumb, um, if you know, like, you've got a bad country or not, is if you've got to actually, like, put a wall all the way around it, and, like, razor wire and machine guns and stuff to keep people in that's when you know you got a bad country, right? Like things are not going well. I'm just going to say that. Things are not going well. And when, when communist East Germany fell, of course, the leader, um, Eric Honecker, uh, lost power. He, he lost his position as the leader. And along with that, he and his wife, Margot, uh, became homeless. They, they were kicked out of their villa. The, the new go- government certainly wasn't going to house them. People despised them. Um, the, their old party was like, no, we don't actually know who they are. I mean, it, they were completely homeless. Now, enter the, enter the picture, enter the story, this one family, one family who was willing to take them in. Pastor Hugh Homer, uh, he was uh, a director of the Christian, uh, Christian Help Center, and he found out what was happening to Eric and Margot Honecker, and, um, and he felt compelled by the love of Jesus to do something about that. And in fact, there, were, there was housing that was a part of his ministry, but he, he knew he couldn't house them in any of those places because he wanted to reserve those for needier people. And so this family took these two people, the most hated folks in Germany, 
into their home. I actually brought them into their home. And here's something that's really important to note of the story is that uh, communist East Germany was really oppressive to churches. And in specific, it was pretty hard on pastors. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Margot uh, was the, the head of all education in East Germany. And one of the things that they did to sort of punish pastors is they wouldn't let their children um, attend secondary education. And so eight out of the ten of their children, of Pastor Homer's children, um, were denied secondary education. Eight out of ten of them. So think about this now. Here are the two human beings that are most responsible for harming their family, harming their family, harming their children's future. The two human beings most responsible for that, and they bring them into their home. And um, so I, I, I read this. Um, I read about this, and I thought, man, this is, this is amazing. Like, this, this kind of love is incredible. It's unbelievable, but it's also beautiful, and the love of Jesus is beautiful. And, and so I thought, man, maybe this is going to make it into the sermon. This, maybe this would be good. And so I started reading, because I don't know if you know this, but sometimes pastors, we, we exaggerate, right? And so I, wanna, I just got to get some other perspective, right? And I find this, this uh, uh, secular news source from Germany, they, they had written an article about this on the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, right? Real interesting. And a couple of things really caught my attention, just real quick. A couple of things caught my attention. One is that, that uh, these folks, Eric Conacher, was completely unrepentant. That's how the story portrayed him. In fact, there's a picture of him coming out of the, the courtroom um, at, at his trial. He's, he's arrested a couple of years later, coming out with his fist in the air, right? Completely unrepentant. So think about that. This family brought him into their home, and it wasn't that they came to them and they were crying and they were in repentance and they said, we are so sorry for what we did to you, so sorry for these things that we did. No, 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 completely unrepentant. But the thing that got my attention most was how this, this secular author talked about this extraordinary love. Listen to this. Uh, he says, with nowhere else to stay, the ex-ruler and his wife, Margo, found refuge with a Protestant pastor and his family in Brandenburg. It was a peculiar situation. <laughs> it was a peculiar situation considering the degree to which churches were persecuted in the GDR and the fact that the children of pastors were not allowed to attend secondary school there. It was a peculiar situation. You see, when the love of Jesus gets lived out in this world, it tends to get noticed. And I tell you, the world doesn't even know what to do with it, honestly. Seeing the love of Jesus Christ, uh, the best the world seems to be able to come up with is, well, gee, that's weird. <laughs> I don't know why they would do that. That is peculiar, isn't it? It is a peculiar situation. But here's the thing. The love of Jesus Christ is so winsome. It is so compelling. It is so attractive. And when driven home by the power of the Holy Spirit, the love of Jesus Christ has the power to change any heart, even the hardest heart. And here's the thing about us, is that we know every demonstration of the love of Jesus Christ in this world points to the love of Jesus Christ, glorifies Jesus Christ, and ultimately points toward His gospel, points toward His cross, that He proved His love by dying for us while we were yet sinners. No merit, no beauty, it was only His love that kept him there on the cross. And so, let us therefore choose to be those that Jesus is looking for. Let those who would hear, those who have ears to hear, he says, let's be those who have ears to hear and who are willing to be a poured out people, who are willing to love in a love-starved world, who are willing to have hearts that are tender and compassionate and willing to serve and willing to give and willing to forgive by the power of Jesus in the love of Jesus, and for the glory of Jesus. May it be so, in his holy name. Amen. Amen. And if you would, please, please join me in prayer. Oh Lord, we do thank you and we give you praise for your love. Because we know that apart from your love, your decision to love us and to save us, we are completely lost. But you have. You have proven your love for us and that you died for us, Lord Jesus, while we were yet sinners. And so, fill us, transform us, 
use us in that very same love. And we pray for this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen.